Hello and welcome to United Church of Christ, Fort Lauderdale, where you are loved and you are welcome. We invite you to come in and join us for worship. It's just about to begin.
morning, everyone. We are truly blessed to be gathering together, even though we're spread out across North America. We have Michelle and Maurice up in Quebec. We have church family in Arizona and Washington State, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and even here, right here, good old Southeast Florida. So to all of you, let me just say that no matter where you are in your journey, wherever you are physically, wherever you are mentally and spiritually, you are welcome here to spend this time with us. And we reach out to you today to bring you music and the word. Our service today is about finding God in the challenges of life and in the midst of storm. Uh, our pastor's message today is very good timing for all of us. We have so many challenges these days. Isolation, loneliness, physical health and health challenges, just to name a few. I think of the, storm, the song Stormy Weather by Lena Horne and that line keeps raining all the time. Well, we have the opportunity this morning to pull out of the storm, to find peace in the music and the words, and in the presence of the people who care about you and me. Thank you for being here, and may you be blessed is my prayer for you today. Thank you. The United Church of Christ denomination mission statement, united in the spirit, inspired by God's grace to welcome all, love all, and seek justice for all.
morning, please join me in the call to worship. Come, rest your spirits in the Lord. We come hungering and thirsting for God's word. This is a place of peace and hope where all may be fed and healed. Please help us to understand healing. Bring us to the time of healing and come. Place your trust in God who is always near you. Open our hearts, Lord, to hear your word and feel your presence. Amen. Today's reading is from 1 King, chapter 19, verses 9 through 15. At that place, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. The Gospel reading today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, Jesus went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there all alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed a strong wind, Peter became frightened and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, and he called him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you have doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. storm howls around me 
A while back, I heard a story about a visiting pastor who attended a men's breakfast in a rural country setting at a church. And the group had asked before the breakfast an older farmer who had attended, and, you know, standing there in his bib overalls to say the prayer before they ate for the morning breakfast. So the farmer raises his hands and asks everyone to bow. And he says, Lord, I hate buttermilk. Well, the visiting pastor kind of glanced over and thought, what? So the farmer who was praying continues to pray. And he says, Lord, you know, I hate lard. Now the visiting pastor could feel people being uncomfortable in the room and started to glance even more, wondering where this prayer was going. And finally the farmer in the bib overall says, Lord, and you know I don't care much about white flour. So at this point the visiting pastor was very nervous and had no idea what was going on as the bib farmer continued to pray. But Lord, you know when you mix them all together and you bake them, I do love warm, fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up that we don't like, when life gets hard, difficult, when we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us to just relax and wait until you're done mixing and it'll probably be better than even biscuits. Amen. I love that and I love biscuits but I love the moral of the story sometimes we just don't understand so today I ask us as a community of faith to get real let's just get real today we have this book this Bible and do we always understand what this book attempts to teach us based on the fact that there are currently over 30,000 Christian denominations that use this book, different Christian denominations around the world, I'd say that often we don't understand what's in this book. One of the ways that Jesus used and often helped us to understand that book and its message is through the use of metaphor and symbolism. Jesus loved to use metaphor, symbolism, and parables to teach the disciples and still today to teach us, to help us understand the message, God's message, the Word of God that flows through those pages. Two days ago, we found Jesus using symbolism and metaphor in attempting to explain to disciples what the kingdom of heaven was like. I still remember those words. All in the same lesson, we heard Jesus use five different scenarios describing the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' own words, He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in three measures of flour. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And also the kingdom of heaven is like a net that's thrown into the sea and it catches fish of every kind. I like that the net doesn't discriminate. Yet we heard after Jesus teaching the disciples this way, all these different examples of what the kingdom of heaven was like, He then asked them, very frustrated was, do you not understand? Do you not understand what I'm saying to you? Do we understand? That's a good question. The use of symbolism and metaphor is a very powerful tool to help us experience God, to understand God and God's love for us and all humanity. The disciples didn't seem to be able to understand, but maybe we can. Our first reading today comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. And in 1 Kings, when it was written, it was a compilation of over 400 years of history 
an oral interpretation of Israel's journey. But from 1 Kings chapter 19 this morning, we find the prophet Elijah. Elijah feeling at the end of his robe. Chaos all around him. All the other prophets had been killed, killed and Elijah is on the road and he's hiding in the cave fearing for his life. And when God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah's response to me was defensive. He says, I've been zealous for you, O Lord. In other words, I've shown intense enthusiasm. So he's trying to make excuses for hiding there in that cave in fear. I've had intense enthusiasm for you, but I'm hiding in a cave. How often do we live in fear of stepping out of the boat or stepping into God's call for us? That we make excuses. Oh, I love you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. But when the rubber hits the road, as they say back home in Tennessee, what do we do? I'm sure God was thinking, well, you don't understand. So what does God tell Elijah to do? God gives Elijah explicit instructions. Leave this cave and go out onto the mountain before the Lord and the Lord is about to pass by. Elijah was afraid at first and he didn't leave the cave. And we hear what, what happened then. We hear that there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. We hear that after the wind an earthquake came, but the Lord was not in the earthquake either. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. So where was the Lord in the midst of this chaos which surrounded Elijah in this cave? Talking about symbolism, I love the symbolism in this part of the story. Because the wind symbolizes the presence of divinity throughout the Bible. So the earthquake symbolizes God's power throughout the Bible. And the fire symbolizes God's holiness and glory throughout the Bible. But in this passage, we're shared that God wasn't in either all three of these. But we hear that after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. So God was found in the sheer silence. And when Elijah heard that, that's when he wrapped his face in the mantle, in other words, his cloak. He wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave and that's when God passed by. When he stepped out of that shelter, that tomb that he was hiding himself in. That's when he experienced God in God's presence in his life. That passage reminds me of hurricanes. I moved here in the year 2000 in the first two years. Uh, you know, there wasn't a hurricane or threat or anything. And I thought, well, what's all the fuss? Well, in year three, God changed that because I experienced my first hurricane. And I had heard about the eye of the storm. And as the hurricane approached Fort Lauderdale, my home, you could feel the pressure of the storm on the house itself. It felt like it was choking the house and choking the life out of everything around it. And then all of a sudden, the eye of the storm passed over our area, our neighborhood. I went out into the outside, outside the door and looked around and there was this stillness like I'd never experienced before. We were in the eye of the storm. I could feel God's presence. I could feel calm. But then, when I read about the eye of the storm later, I learned that around the eye of the storm itself is the harshest part of the storm. The most thunderstorms and the most rain and the most wind. But closest to that is the presence of God. 
The other thing that reminds me about finding God in the presence, it was the first kayak trip I took. A kayaking down the Blackwater River in the Pensacola, North Florida area. And all of a sudden, the water was still. The leaves were still. And I looked up at the blue sky and the spattering of clouds. Everything was still. And what I remember most about that is the peace that I felt. I could hear peace. The presence of God in the stillness. The stillness that Elijah hears symbolizes peace. The peace that Jesus spoke about that only God can give. But when we hide in the cave, when we hoard those spiritual gifts that makes it impossible for, when we don't use them, it makes us impossible to fully experience the presence of God. We live in fear. And the, when the fear of where those gifts may take us and challenge us sometimes, overcomes our faith and our trust in the Lord, we lose out on experience and even a little small glimpse of heaven. We've all been given very special spiritual gifts. And when we hold back and when we hide and we're scared to use them and we're scared to step out of the boat, we miss out. God's not punishing us, but we miss out on experiencing and connecting with God's presence. Speaking of peace, let's journey into the gospel text for today from the book of Matthew we find Jesus had instructed the disciples to go on ahead and take the boat while Jesus went into the mountain in order to pray. And I agree with Reverend Jeff from last week that I believe that Jesus was still in mourning over the death of John the Baptist and the killing of John the Baptist. But after that's over, Jesus comes down and the disciples look out onto the water and they believe what they see to be a ghost. The seas are rocky around them and there's a storm brewing and they're huddled in fear in the boat. But all of a sudden they believe they see a ghost. But they find out it was Jesus. The Jesus, the divine was present. And what do we hear happen next? And I love that how we have changed the story about Peter uh, stepping out of the boat onto the water that it was Peter decided to walk towards Jesus, but he discovered that it was Peter who was testing Jesus. If you are who you say you are, invite me to come to you across the water, to walk across the water to you. And that story reminds me of Doubting Thomas, who also tested Jesus. If it is you, let me feel the nail marks in your hands and your feet. Let me put my hand in the wound in your side. Prove to me that you are who you say you are. So we here we have the same story again. Peter testing Jesus. But I do love that, G that Peter had the faith to step out of the boat. Just like we discovered that Doubting Thomas actually had courage and was honest with Jesus, maybe Peter was the same way. His relationship with Jesus was such a way that he knew he couldn't hide anything from him, so he put it right there out on the plate. That if you are who you say you are, prove it to me. I need to know. Jesus was very patient with him. And as he steps out of the boat onto the water, I can just picture that. But like Elijah, he became afraid. He allowed the fear to overcome him. And when he did, he couldn't be who God created him to be. And he let the fear overcome him. And he began to sink in the water. But what did he find? He found the presence of God. And that presence of God, in the midst of that storm, lifted him up out of the water and helped him back to safety. Quite a story. Where do we find God in the midst of storms? 
So what did we learn today from Elijah's journey living in the midst of chaos and wondering about his future? So what did we learn today about Peter and the storm and the seas and wondering about his and their survival, the waves splashing in and around them? Elijah didn't find God and find peace in the chaos. He found God in the silence of the storm. Peter didn't find his answer either in the midst of the storm, but he found God in the midst of the hurricane, in the eye of the storm. The psalmist uh, David in Psalm 46.10 shares with us, Be still and know that I am God. So th this lectionary readings help reinforce that statement that be still and know that I am God. It explains that the eye of the storm is the strongest that's where God lives. When Jesus went to pray before he met the disciples on the sea, he had met God in the silence also. Amazing, isn't it? The Holy Spirit through both of these stories is teaching us that God is in the stillness. And for us to learn to not allow that chaos to take that away. We can have the pandemic all around us. We can have political divide, we can have racism and homophobia and transphobia, we can have all those things and judgmental people and all that. But when we know God, when we experience God in the silence, just like Elijah did, and then just like him, we can truly be effective as disciples of Christ. Because nothing can change that. Nothing. Thank you, God, for this message, for this lesson, for the understanding that we have attained today. May it transform us. May it nourish us. May it teach us. May, this, may we learn to be different people in your name. Amen. Let us pray. Friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the needs of our sisters and brothers as dear to us as our own needs loving our neighbors as ourselves. We offer our thanksgivings and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. Hear our prayers, God of power, and through the ministry of your Son, free us from the grip of the tomb, that we may desire you as a fullness of life and proclaim your saving needs to all the world. We pray for our divided nation. May love for your neighbor be our choice. We pray for the world suffering from a pandemic. We seek your healing hand in this time of need. We pray for those who are undergoing challenges and difficult times. We call their names out loud now. David. We now sing the prayer taught to us by your Son, Jesus.
stewardship is a commitment of one's self and possessions to God's service. Everything we have comes to us as a blessing from God. In return, we are asked to freely share these blessings and resources with others. May we live in a state of gratefulness as we generously share God's love. May our unconditional love, which we learn from Jesus, help to transform our torn and hurting world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul shares with us, each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. As God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As God has blessed us, may we bless others.
May we break bread together on our knees. May we break bread together on our knees. When we fall on our knees with our face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, we thank you for this meal, this holy meal we share every week. No matter where we are, this table, this love unites us together. We thank you for Jesus who gave his life so that we may live. We thank you for the cup of the new covenant. Uh, Jesus' love poured out for each of us, for all humanity. We share this meal together. We thank you, God, for these gifts. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for nourishing us in both body and spirit. Be with us. Be with us always. Guide us. Lead us. Teach us. We're thankful for this meal. May it nourish us in both body and in spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining in for today's worship service. And as we end this service, always remember that out in this world as disciples of Christ, our hands are God's hands, and our feet are God's feet, and our words are God's words. Go in peace to serve and love the Lord. Amen.